sorry they don't yet have your exams graded. I am distracted about the number of other things, but I will have that for you soon. Uh, and with a, a um, temporary grade. <coughs> the, uh, the problem set, the extra credit assignment is due on Thursday, and um, we'll try to have that in as soon as we get back to grading. Okay? And we'll discuss it. All right, folks. Very good. So, we've been talking about uh, the quantum mechanics of identical particles. And the way we've done that is the following. What we've done is we said, OK, so let H be the Hilbert space. We might restrict ourselves to a finite dimension of that Hilbert space, or in general, this will be an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Right? And then if we have uh, n identical particles, what we said is that the Hilbert space associated with would be, we would arrive at that by looking at the tensor product of all the Hilbert spaces associated with each of those particles and then properly symmetrized or anti-symmetrized over all States, we've look, we look at the subspace of this tensor product space that is either symmetric or anti symmetric under the exchange of any two uh, particles in the space, right? For bosons and fermions. Now, this is a kind of awkward construction. It's awkward because we introduce these labels on all the particles just to throw them away because they're meaningless. <laughs> I mean, we symmetrize anti symmetry. It doesn't matter what's particle one or particle two or particle three. There is no meaning to that because they're identical particles. So it's a kind of silly construction and it makes for a lot of extra overhead in trying to keep track properly of the identical particles. Okay? So there's a better way. There's a better way in dealing with that, and that's the construction of Fox space. Okay? Which, for reasons that are arcane, and I'll explain where it comes from in a little bit, this is also known as second quantization. So instead of uh, this construction for identical particles, we're going to have a, a, a new algebraic structure for our Hilbert space. Okay? And the way we're going to define it, so it's, of course, so what the Fox space is defined, firstly, we have, again, identical particles. And restrict ourselves here to Bose or Fermi. We're not going to talk about parasitistics like any ions. Okay. Although we could. No. Someone could. Uh, I'm not sure I could perfectly. Um, and again, the construction has each particle described by a Hilbert space 
H, just like before, of dimension D. Okay, and D could be infinity. Um, and then we define the Fox space to be the direct sum, that is to say, the union of subspaces associated with n, n particles. So H sub n here is the Fox space for n particles, n n of particles. I include, and it's important in the construction, the space associated with no particles. Okay? But I can have the space with no particles, the space with one particle, the space with two particles, etc., up to some n max. And n max might be infinity. I might allow myself to have infinite possible number of particles. We, we would typically do that if we were talking about things like photons, where photons can be infinitely created or annihilated, or, or in, in a general relativistic field theory. But in non-relativistic cases, we would typically have some fixed possible number of particles and it max would be some number. Yeah. Oh, OK. Right, OK. So um, what can we say? Let's look at this space, Hn. So um, a basis of states in Hn is the following. Well, I have a d-dimensional covert space. Okay, for each individual particle, right? So, um, if I have, therefore, d possible states that are orthogonal basis states in H, then one way to def define a basis for Hn is just to fill in some number of particles in each of the, that basis states. So I'm going to define a little notation that is somewhat my own, uh, uh, but I find it useful as the following. So I'm going to let curly brackets without, they're, they're, those are rounded cats. be states in my single particle Hilbert space, okay? So if there's a single particle Hilbert space, these are states in that. The angle bracket states will be states in the Hilbert space, for whatever dimension it is, okay? It could be Hn, H1, it doesn't matter. It's in this space, all right? Um, so if we do a basis for H, okay, so that's the set of some set of ortho, ortho and uh, let me call it a orthonormal basis. of the basis states, where 
I'm restricting myself here to the case where the total number of particles is n. Okay? So what that's saying is I have n possible particles, capital N here, and I can distribute them in these D boxes. Those D boxes correspond to D different orthogonal states associated with each of the particles. Okay? So I have D different orthogonal states, and I can put some number in each of them. Right? So, so the, the, the lower index label is the state. In, in, in That's right. Okay. So this is saying, so this, so n sub i, so the way I should interpret this is there are n sub i particles in e i. In e i. That's what that means. Okay. And uh, the total number of particles is constrained to be n. So now, I ask you, what is the dimension of this Hilbert space? Well, it depends if these are bosons or fermions, right? First of all, if they're, what we could say is if they're fermions, and this, these are, are supposed to represent, you know, all the quantum numbers that this I index represents all the quantum numbers that completely specifies a state in my single particle Hilbert space. Then for fermions, n sub i has only two possible values, 0 or 1. I can have no more than one particle in a state, right? In a, in a, in a single particle or little or if you like. Of course, the orbital is also labeled by its spin in this case. For bosons, n sub i can be 0 up to 1, 2, all the way up to possibly n. Right? I could have the state where all n <coughs> particles are in state 1, and then there would be 0 in all the rest absolutely valid state for bosons, okay? So now, given this fact, what is the dimension of this Hilbert space for bosons or fermions? Let's talk about fermions first. Well, I have n particles. Right? And these states that they can be distributed. Now I have to, I'm assuming here uh, that D is greater than or equal to N. Okay? So now I ask you, how many, what's the dimension of the Silver space? And one of those combinatorics, don't they? Yes. N? No, that's not yes. Let's think about it. I have to put I have n particles that I can put in D boxes, but I can't have more than one particle in a box. Well, that's really just the number of ways of how many ways I just pick some of them to have ones and the rest of them are zeros, right? So it's the number of ways of picking uh, n out of D. So it's D, choose N. Right? So that's D factorial over N factorial N minus D factorial where or D minus N factorial where D is greater than okay. What about for bosons? Well, that's a hard one actually. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. What it is. I know. I didn't either. I have to look it up. You can I did this problem for his thesis, but I don't even remember. Well, it's it's a, you know it's a combinatorial problem. And the answer is this: it's d plus n 
minus 1, choose n. Okay? So that's a question. You have stars and bars, and you kind of have to partition things. It's a combinatorial problem that I hate. And so anyway, but that's the answer. So it's d plus n minus 1 factorial over n factorial. So first thing I just want to mention is that these spaces are not tensor product spaces. And we kind of already know that because these spaces are, have to be isomorphic to these spaces. They're one and the same. We're just labeling things differently in a more convenient way. And these spaces are subspaces of tensor product spaces that are either completely symmetric or completely anisymmetric. And those subspaces are themselves not tensor product spaces. Okay? Um, now, there is one exception to that rule. And that is, in the case of bosons, Suppose I have bosons. And we let n max equal infinity. Okay? Suppose we do that. Well, then. What I claim is that the total thought space, which is the union or direct sum of the subspaces associated with this, well, it's the span of all the basis vectors, right? And the basis vectors are these, where each of these goes from 0 to infinity. I don't have to constrain anything anymore because I have an infinite number of particles, right? So that's this Hilbert space is this Hilbert space, right? But notice what that Hilbert space is. That Hilbert space is just the span equivalently, since this has every state of this tensor this, tensor, this. Every one of those states is in the Hilbert space. Okay? So this, for this particular case, when I have bosons, and when I allow myself to have an, an unbounded number of particles, then the space is in fact isomorphic to a tensor product of Hilbert spaces associated with what? Well, we recognize this. This is the Hilbert space of a harmonic oscillator, where each one of these can be thought of as the occupation number of the nth oscillator state. Okay, So I can think about n sub i this space, where n sub i can be 0, 1, 2, up to infinity, as the, so the span of this is the Hilbert space of a simple harmonic oscillator. Now, there's, no, no, there's nothing here that is an oscillator, per se. It's just a label. I mean, these, this is really, this space, the Hilbert space of a, of a simple harmonic oscillator, we know what that Hilbert space. This is the space L2R. It's the square, space of square normalizable wave functions over the line. That is that Hilbert space. I don't have to think about, since it's the span of that space, I don't have to think about these as Hermite polynomials. I can think about them, the span of that is any 
wave functions that are normalizable on the line is this Hilbert space. Again, this is due to the cons that we don't have the constraint that the sum of the particle is correct. constant. It's finite. That's correct. Yeah. It's, and, and it's fixed. Yeah. It's it's fixed at some n. Yeah. Here it's arbitrary and possibly infinite. Okay. So that's a little bit of something to keep in mind because it allows us to have a construction for defining states on this Fox space in a very convenient and elegant way. Okay. And so now we're talking about the construction. of creation and annihilation operators. Okay. Firstly, there's one, there's one, in this construction, there are two things. Firstly, there's the notion of the back. What do we mean by that? Well, let's consider the space A0 with no particles. Okay. What is the dimension of that Hilbert space? Well, it's the number of ways of putting nothing <laughs> into this. And there's only one way to do that. Right. So this space is dimension one, and that one's it's only one set, one normalized state with some phase convention that is in that space. And that space, the thing that's in that space, we call the vacuum. It's got no particles in the first state, no particles in the second state, no particle in the deep state for any basis. Okay. And that state, we typically just call zero without all those labels. All right. Next, I define the following. For all states in my single particle Hilbert space, define a dagger labeled by that state, okay? Such that this operator, this is an operator on the Fox space, such that this The creating the creation operator associated with that is that. In other words, there is this is a, uh, a state in my Fox space associated with one part. Okay, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these roundy bracket states in my H and my angled bracket states associated with one particle. They're the same space. I'm just labeling them differently. Okay. And what I'm saying is that there is some operator that maps the node to that. That's what I'm defining a dagger that way. A dagger maps the vacuum to the one particle state associated with that. Um, we can see some properties of that kind of operator. For example, let us consider a state in my single particle Hilbert space, which is some
superposition of states. Okay. Now, now I ask you, what is this in terms of these guys? Well, it's linear. It has to be linear, right? Because this state, if I look at this acting if it on that, that's supposed to be this. But that state is alpha this plus beta that if I am chi, right? Because this state is that superposition. And this is a dagger on the vacuum. And this is a dagger chi. That's just, the A dagger is linear. to talk about creation of operations, but it's a more general construction than that. So at this point, I'm just saying we have particles. Mm -hmm. They're identical. They're either bosons or fermions. And for every state in my single particle Hilbert space, I can define a creation operator in this way. Okay. Notice the, so I can let this operator, so not that. So A on this is the dagger of that. Okay. And notice that if this state is a superposition of two other states that I choose to write down phi and chi, then A of psi isn't linear, but anti-linear. So you got to be careful. Right? Because I take the dagger of that, and the dagger changes the A daggers to A's, but it complex conjugates. All right. Now, if I look at, um, so let me consider so this is a dagger.
is that. Right? Which means that this has to be zero for all. So this operator is the annihilation. We haven't done anything, really. We had a single particle Hilbert space, H, and now we have a single particle Hilbert space in the Spock space, and we just made a one-to-one -one mapping, and we defined these things called the A and A dagger, but it's not, it's kind of overhead here. Where this has become interesting when we think about more than one particle, okay? So now let's think about the multi-particle space. such that if I apply the exchange operator to this 
state, I've got plus or minus the state depending upon whether it was boson or fermion. Right? So now I want to say, what is the exchange operator in the Fox space? So the exchange operator in the Fox space, so the exchange is the two particles, just says that this is this in the other direction. First create this and then create that. That's the definition of the exchange operator. It just exchanges the order in which I create the two parts. Okay. And this has to equal, I'm sorry, should be plus, pardon me. And this has to equal plus or minus the original state. And the original state was, as I wrote it, first create phi and then create psi. And so this has to be true for any two states. We have the following group very important relation. What it tells me is that for bosons, it doesn't matter what order I write these creation operators. Okay. Or said another way, a dagger phi psi commutes with a dagger phi for all states in the Hilbert space. Okay? In contrast, and annoyingly, but you know, this is the stuff that he needs to make up. For fermions, the A daggers associated with states, no matter what they are, anti-commute. You had if you exchange them, you have to put a minus sign. Okay, that is to say that this plus this is zero. And that is sometimes written, but not always, as a curly bracket. Sometimes it's, you write this is plus or minus, where this is the commutator, that's the anti-commutator. I prefer the notation in the curly bracket. Because you got lots of roundies and curlies and angles, so why stop now? So this is commutes, and this anti-commutes for all possible states, OK? Of course, I can take the adjoint of both sides, and this tells me that the same thing is true of the creation operator. For bosons, all annihilation operators commute with one another. For fermions, all annihilation operators anti-commute with one another. Notice we say nothing about the commutators of the A daggers or the A's for fermions. We don't know what they are. They're not defined. What's defined is the anti-commutator. Right? The anti-commutator, again, just to write it out, the anti-commutator, because it's less familiar, is the sum in the
Well, that, like, it doesn't matter what the state is, this is true for no matter what, then that says that the anti-commutator of this with itself, which is twice this squared, is zero. Which tells me that for fermions, a dagger squared for any state is the zero operator. Does that make sense? Is that what you would expect? Why do you have some not because yes, why? Exactly. This is a statement of the Pauli exclusion principle. Not the Pauli exclusion principle. I have a brother who's getting this Pauli. Let me say it in the case. It's not in culture. It's principle. Ah, this looks good. I love you. All right. So if you have a uh, state like this, for fermions, this is one particle in state one, oops, zero particles in state two, one particle in state three, one particle in state four, etc. Right? And I try to apply the creation operator and put another particle into state one, well, this is equal to a dagger one, a dagger three, a dagger four, on the vacuum. And that's zero, because I get two fermions in the same box. X can't have that. All right, what about the um, relations between com uh, creation and annihilation operators? Okay, so let's consider the following thing. Let us consider <coughs> So it's a given, it's equivalent to what we inherited from the structure of the one particle Hilbert space, right? So what this tells me is that these can't commute, right? It can't be this case that this. Um, equals this unless these two states are orthogonal. Right? If they're orthogonal, then the right hand side is zero. And then it's fine to just switch them because that would be zero, because the annihilation operator, we said, annihilates the vacuum. But in general, it couldn't be true. It can't be true that this that equals that. What is it? So instead, we must define the following that the commutator of these two states, we define them, the commutator as this. For bosons. And the anti commutator. I haven't really 
proved this. It's a complicated proof, and I struggled with it last night. And said, ah, I'll, just, I'll write it out in the notes. Yeah? Should that be curly on the right hand side of the first line? This? Yes. Where how First right line, hand? right hand side. This guy. This is the inner product between the two states. Those two states exist in the single particles over in space. So whatever inner product we inherit. Now, of course, this is the same thing as this. This is one and the same thing, right? Because these are both one particle states. What I'm saying is whatever I start there is a structure here where we have a one particle Hilbert space. That one particle Hilbert space has a structure, it has a inner product, and we inherit it. And we inherit it in such a way that the commutator for bosons between creation and annihilation operators associated with states is nothing more than the inner product between the states. And for fermions, it's the anti. Probably not how you've seen it before, if you've seen it at all. But this is really how you think about it. Um, all right, so let's see. Right, so now let's consider. basis for my single particle Hilbert space. All right. And let me define a dagger sub i as just a dagger when I created the i. So I just don't have to carry around all that extra notation. Okay, so I've I have defined a basis, an orthonormal basis, and they're labeled by index here. I go from one to B. Alright? So now what can you tell me about bosons and fermions? Well, for bosons. The creation operators for all these D basis states, or the annihilation operators for all these D basis states, commute. Okay? And what about this? Well, according to the rule, that is equal to, I mean, this is a shorthand for creating in the state E sub i, or annihilating in the state E sub i, and creating in the state E sub j, right? And this, according to the rule, is the inner product between those, which is what? Delta i j, right? It's zero if they're different states because they're orthogonal. And they're one because I've chosen this to be an orthonormal basis. Okay. N notice that we'll come back to this again. This is nothing more than the algebra of a set of independent simple harmonic oscillators, right? If I have a set of oscillators, simple harmonic oscillators, like two uh, masses that are on the pendula and springs, right, for example then the two different oscillators 
commute with one another. And within a given oscillator, we have the, the simple harmonic oscillator commutation relations of A and A dagger. So I can think about this equivalently as a set of simple harmonic oscillators. You know, this is, there's, not, there's really nothing about a simple harmonic oscillator here. It's just an algebraic relation. And similarly for fermions, we have the anti commutators. Uh, so these and the all the creation operators commute with each other for the different orthonormal states, and all the annihilation operators anti-commute with one another. I don't know what their commutator is. I don't know. No one knows. They're not specified, necessarily. And the anti-commutator of these. Uh, now, the basis states that we wrote down at the beginning of this discussion there on the front board having to do with n particles in given states. Now, we can write down in terms of the vacuum and the creation operators, right? So, the state with that. Well, it's at least proportional to, I have to think about the normalization. I create n1 particles in mode 1, or in state 1, n2 particles, n sub d particles, as you know, the Now, because of this fact, we know that this is nothing more than the algebra of simple harmonic oscillators. So we can use what we learn that arose from these commutation relations to find out what this normalization is and to explicitly see what happens when we apply creation annihilation operators. Um, so for example, for bosons, following is true. If I apply the annihilation operator to the ith mode of the i associated with the ith mode to the state, one of these basis states, where I have n sub i particles in state i, then what is this? N1 into n i plus 1. This guy minus one, because it's annihilation. And what about the normalization? Mm, well, this is a normalized state. So I ask you, let's go back to a simple harmonic oscillator. If I have one mode and I apply the annihilation operator to it, what do I get? N minus one, what goes out from? Square root of n. Square root of n, thank you very much. Right? So this is square root of n sub i, n1, n2, dot, 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 ni minus 1, dot, 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 n d. Okay? And similarly, is what? Remembering that part about all the 
1 over the square roots of this, I can get, if I wanted to, well, let me, instead of writing it again, let's just put it over here, equals what? Well, I have to have 1 over the square root of n1 factorial, n2 factorial, dot, 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 n sub e factorial. Right? That's the normalization. Because we remember, for a simple harmonic oscillator, This connection between the algebra of the simple harmonic oscillator and the algebra associated with Fox space is one of the reasons that we care a lot about the simple harmonic oscillator, amongst the many reasons that we care, care about it. But that's also the reason why one often calls the algebra associated with the collection of simple harmonic oscillators the boson algebra even though it may not have anything to do with boson. We just call it that because it has the same algebra as associated with a set of, of bosons. Okay. What about the fermion? Oh, oh, yeah, I guess there's one other thing for the bosons we should remember, of course. A dagger A acting on this. Is what? And sabai. And sabai. And what? And two. Right. So it's the number operator. It's an eigenstate of this with eigenvalue and sabai. relations we know about that, for example, and so the I commuted with so I dagger is that. Okay. Oh. All right, what about fermions? operator, so there's no normalization to worry about. What about the number? Is this the number operator? I never know whether fermion should be capitalized or not. I mean, feel by respect to fermion, but I think in another way, when you're so important that your actual word then doesn't even matter small letter because you're, you're a thing, you're, you're a disembodiment of Fermi, which is a fermion. So, out of respect, I'm a small letter. Um, for fermions, uh, is the number operator? Let's say, does it count the number of fermions? The reason I, this is a question is because we, in the context of the bosons, this follows directly from this. Okay, so the commutation relations of N with a dagger showed us, when we studied the simple harmonic oscillator, that this was an eigenvector of the number operator with eigenvalue n. But we don't know that fermion because we don't know what the commutation relations are. They're not specified. The anti-commutation relations are. Okay, but let's do an example. Let's, let's look at the state I wrote down there. So consider a state, for example, one and one, zero and two, one and three, one and four, 
and then zero everywhere else. Yeah, just say that. Okay. So let's, this state is equal to a dagger one, a dagger three, a dagger four on the back. Okay. So now let's, so let me call this state. So now let's, what happens if, for example, I look at a dagger 3a, this is on this state. I should get it back with a plus and minus if it's the number operator. Let's check that. through here, but I have to use the amp to commutator, right? That means every time I switch them, I have to put in a minus sign. Yeah? But if A3 and A1 don't, don't, um, don't deal with the same cats, why can't you move through it without Because we don't know anything because they're con they don't necessarily commute. They anti-commute. So you can move them through if they commute. But you can't move them through the anti-commute. Every time you move it through, you have to add, put in a minus one. Okay? So what we could say, these guys anti-commute. So I can switch this and this and put a minus one there. Right? Because when I switch them, I put in a minus one. Now what about this? A and A dagger, their anti-commutator is 1. So this is 1 minus A3 dagger. Oh. Right? But I put it in that other order. Okay, so now what do we have? We have A3 dagger, a one dagger, a three dagger, a four dagger. That's this term, right? With the one, and then I have this stuff which is minus a3 dagger, a1 dagger, a3 dagger, a3, a4. Uh, yes, oh, I have to keep track of that. I do. There's a minus here and a plus there. Does the first one have an extra A3 dagger? Did I screw it up somewhere? Sorry. So I switched it. Yeah, yeah the A3 dagger. Yeah, the A3 dagger. Yeah, the A3 between the one and four. Should you get rid of the other? Uh, Sorry. The dagger the first A3 dagger, A1 dagger. The A4 A3 dagger. dagger. Not the plus the one. top one, you have four choice of three. The one. I, there's a one. So this is correct, is it not? You gotta get rid of that A3 dagger because it turns into the one doesn't it? There's only three daggers. Oh, 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 this is gone. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah. Sorry, I I did a different example. I should have I should have just done the one in my notes. 
But anyway, let's just, let's let's let me take a look at this. See if I got it. Right? Plus. Okay. Right. Now what? Well, I can switch these guys and put a minus sign. Right? Well, what's this? A3 dagger squared, which is zero. Sayonara. And what is this? Well, I can switch back, exchange back A1 and A3. And voila, indeed. You could do this always. This is the number operator. Okay? All right. So, those are states in the, in the Fox space. What about? Operators on the Fox case. So, what do I mean by that? Well, <coughs> suppose we let A be an operator on I single particle Hilbert space. Okay? I want to define an operator. This operator could be, for example, uh, Expressed in a basis. So I can write this by the usual method of inserting complete set of states. Right? This is the matrix element AIJ. Okay? So this is how we would always write a operator written in a matrix representation. Okay. So now I want to promote this with the tassel to the other side. It's now on the box space. So I want to say this is an operator on the box space. It's obviously a single body operator. This is a one body operator. Because it acts on a single part. Okay. So now I want to know how do I promote this on Fox space? Well, here's the rule. see that that must be the rule. Well, if I wanted to think about this on the Fox space, I could write it as state is. Created that state. 
greater that state. So if I want to think about it in a more general context, I write it this way. Without putting this in the middle. So this is a state, this is now the operator. So any single body operator has this form. Okay. What about multiple body operators? Well, that, as we saw, was a very awkward construction when we dealt with the symmetrized or anti-symmetrized space. If we wanted, if we had a two-body operator, Well, if we had identical particles, if I had, I'd have to write A on one, two, I have to symmetrize it. Right? That was the only way I could write down an appropriate operator for identical particles. Okay? And then I would have, you know, in this case, I would have basis elements, which would be, you know, EI1, EJ2, which are either symmetrized or anti-symmetrized, depending on, the, on whether they're bosons or fermions. have to keep track of all that nonsense. So what do I do instead? So suppose, so let This is like bra cat. So two body operators now involve two creation and annihilation operators. I annihilate particles in the state I prime J prime followed by creating particles in the state ij. And the matrix element that tells me how to do that was inherited from my signal. But I don't have to symmetrize or anti-symmetrize anything. The symmetry or anti-symmetry of the matrix elements will be accounted for by the commutation or anti-commutation relations of these guys. All right, we will pick this up next time. We will complete our discussion of the main line states. I promise I'll have your test for you. And you'll also have an opportunity to evaluate the course. And then we'll talk about Maybe some bonus lectures next week.
yeah, uh, where we talk about the application of this to quantum field theory and beyond. All right? Have a good afternoon, everybody.